Thanks everyone for coming to our leadership speaker series. Today our speaker is Sheriff uh, Scott. A little bit of background on Sheriff Scott. He uh, served 29 years in the Sheriff's Department and in July of 2011 he was actually appointed Sheriff and elected in 2012. Uh, during his 29 years he's done a lot in the community and leadership and courtrooms in the community, in the classroom. And he's been also a leader among his own team. Actually, we had a number of his um, employees coming, he didn't know this, uh, train our uh, detention officers on leadership and how to prepare yourself to move to the next level, how to prepare yourself to take instruction. So that environment is a, a difficult environment to work in every day, but his staff was willing to come over and train our staff on two occasions. Also, they just recently helped conduct the craze training for us. How many of you attended the, tra the craze training? Okay. Um, active shooter training that we had um, that was mandatory for our court officers in Baylor. So we had 61 court employees attend that training. So the sheriff's office has been working with us on a daily basis. We all, we all have our deputy sheriff station on our floors in case something goes wrong. I've used them on a number of occasions to help keep the peace and to help take care of those who've been hurt in the courtroom. Get them to stay. So I appreciate everything they've done for us. She didn't help me well. Can everyone hear me all right? Am I going through? All right, well, thanks for having me. Doug, I appreciate you inviting me down here. Um, in the next hour, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about leadership. Is that pretty cool? <laughs> Obviously, I, I can't even scratch hardly the surface when it comes to leadership. If you if you take the time to just Google or go on websites, you will see tons and tons of books out on leadership. I have some that are my favorite. I have some that are, uh, I like to look at movies and, and watch the leadership styles of movies or read books and leadership. My, a little bit about me, my degree is in organizational leadership. Okay, I, I got some, basically no one was really getting degrees in leadership in and of itself. Uh, and I have a business administration degree. So I did a couple major, but that was my, that was my degree was in, in organizational leadership. Um, and I'm gonna start moving the slides here a little bit. I, I need to talk a little bit about the Frank County Sheriff's Office so you understand a lot of people don't really know what we do. Um, and so I'm going to spend about five to ten minutes explaining what we do, how big we are, what we're dealing with on a regular basis, so you can start to get the idea of the techniques and the, the philosophies behind what I employ as, as my leadership style. We might have a lot of different types of styles up there, which we'll discuss a little bit about. But I just want to give you an idea of, of what the Sheriff's Office is about. Um, I just think that was, okay, we're just to that part. All right, we have about... Uh, we got over 1,200 actually employees, if you count my 60 or so part-time employees. So we got around 1,200 employees at Frank County Sheriff's Office. And uh, our budget's around 120, 126 million. Uh, there's our calls for service, subpoenas we serve, uh, cases, CCW. Anybody here got a CCW permit? We got one, two, three. You got insurance with that? Did, did you buy your insurance that you can get yearly with that? Make sure you do that. Because even if you have a, a good and righteous shoot, you'll still get sued. So you'll be paid right out of your pocket if you don't have that $100 a year you can get. So just make sure you cover yourself on that. Um, got two jails. We're presently, the Frank County Sheriff's Office houses about 2,000 inmates uh, per day. That's our daily average population, around 2,000. I think last month it was 2,400. Uh, I, when I worked at jail, myself, my background is I worked at jail. I worked I worked patrol, I worked undercover, I worked SWAT uh, for about 12 years or so, 13. I, I worked homicides for about 14 years, I worked community relations when I left, uh, and then retired and became chair. So I had a good, uh, I guess, background in all the different divisions, pretty much, not all of them, obviously, because we have a lot, but a, a good majority of those. And I can remember a count being as high as 2,600 inmates at the, at, the jail, at the jail. And many times we don't have beds that kind of space, so we just take a mattress and throw it on the floor and say, dude, that's, your, that's where your bed is, that's where you're sleeping, you can have space for it. So presently, we are uh, in the process of building a new jail, which is way overdue, uh, and 
that is uh, anticipated to probably break ground probably next year sometime. Uh, it's in discussion if it's going to be 800 to 900 bed JR, they're going to pay another $150 million to try to get it up to about a 2200 bed facility. So we'll see, but we have two facilities uh, going 24 seven. I have, uh, basically I got four divisions. I got the corrections, I got patrol, I got investigations, and then I have an administrative division, which is always, they're just as busy as any of the other divisions. But in our patrol, we got your basic patrol division like you'd see with any patrol division. Uh, Columbus or, you know, how many law enforcement agencies here in Franklin County? Anybody know real quick? About 28. Most people don't know. There's about 28 different law enforcement agencies alone here just in Franklin County. Um, Columbus obviously is the biggest one, and then Sheriff's Office would be next. Uh, some more of the stuff, the Detective Bureau, Special Investigators Unit, we have a lot of, of task force that we're on from DEA to FBI to Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force to, I mean, the list just goes on the different task force that we're involved in on a regular basis from federal and state. Um, we had a bomb squad, uh, civil, a real estate division, which isn't up there, uh, which keeps us pretty busy too. And we have the Training Academy, which is brand new, Internal Affairs, uh, unfortunately they're kind of busy, which is uh, not always a good thing, Human Resources, Finance. Uh, some of those, we get some of the awards that we get at the Sheriff's Office. When I came in about five and a half years ago, we were, um, I had a lot of goals to set, and some of these, we're getting some of these awards that we actually have, Green Task Force, we have Mental Health, uh, that's in our jail, 30% of the inmates in our jail uh, have some type of mental health issue. They've been taking some type of psychiatric or psychotropic drugs. Almost 30% of them are jail filled with those individuals. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, courthouse security, we never had courthouse security before, before I became sheriff. Basically we had security guards, but no guns. And unfortunately we were seeing shootings go all over the country. So we uh, were the first to get that here actually, the sheriff's office. Uh, we got more patrol. We have Citizens Academy, which is a pretty big deal. Community Advisory Board, shop with the sheriff. Community Advisory Board is a, um, a group of individuals from either the faith base, business base, that basically come in and give me their advice and opinions about things. We've heard of Citizens Review Boards, right? Everybody's heard of those? All right, my, my opinion is that the grand jury serves as a Citizens Review. But what I wanted to bring in was a Citizens Advisory Board so they can give you their opinions, give you their thoughts. Uh, see if they like what we're doing, um, just to just get our communities involved. Because as, as the sheriff, we've been very, very involved in our communities all over Franklin County and all the different municipalities. Uh, we have volunteers in uh, public safety service, which is another one. Uh, we just have a lot of stuff that you guys, it's all free. Uh, you guys get a chance to go through the Citizens Academy, you will have a blast. If you, get, if you go through the uh, VIPS program, which is volunteers in public safety, which one's just started now, it teaches you how to take care of yourself and your family and then become part of our community in, in case there's a natural disaster, if there's a terrorist a, a event, something of that nature. It gives you the opportunity to know what to do in these types of situations and work with your first responders. Uh, we have about 400 people now, I think. We're trying to get it up to 1,000. So that way, if we have something happen, you guys can come out and work with us. Uh, we have the HOPE Task Force, uh, which is uh, something that one of my chiefs started, uh, working with uh, the county coroner. Uh, you know, heroin is a big deal. We're the first to charge somebody in Central Ohio that we can find. At the prosecutor's office, we're the first to actually charge somebody that um, gave heroin to someone, and we charged that person with involuntary manslaughter. So the first, that's the first one from Central Ohio, and the sheriff's office was able to get that, get that person charged and indicted on that. We have full-time SWAT teams. There's only three full-time SWAT teams based in the state of Ohio. Okay, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it, Huge deal. Columbus has full time SWAT, Cleveland has full time SWAT. Cincinnati doesn't have full time SWAT, they have part time SWAT. And then Frank County Sheriff's Office. What does that mean? That means if we have a school shooting, we have a mall shooting, because we work with Columbus all the time, uh, or DEA, or we get requested by the FBI. It means that time is of the essence and we can start moving in that direction now. Instead of having a part time team to where you have to go and get changed out and you get your gear and it's certainly that way. So we have people available that if we have a Catastrophe or any type of event, you know that you have officers that are in route immediately because they're on duty 24 7. So that, that is a big deal. Uh, we have corrections. Um, 
kind of talked about that. We have a new class getting ready to start. All right. Now that you know a little bit about the sheriff's office, a little bit about my background, let's talk a little bit about leadership. And I encourage questions. If you guys got questions, I'm very, very interactive. If I can answer, I, I will. Why do we have a set of trees up here in this nice little pond? Well, it's a little joke that I started and it kind of like got some, I guess, traction within the ranks. I have basically about, I have, like I said, the four divisions. I have my four chiefs. And under those four chiefs, they have their majors. And they also have caps. And everybody likes to uh, give, up, give advice when you're, when you're the boss. Everybody wants to tell you how to do it better, right? Because everybody outside knows how to do your jobs better than you know how to do them, right? You get that all the time. Am I the only one that gets that? You guys get that too. And what I have found, and, I, and it was an analogy that I started with uh, an old lieutenant of mine, who used to be my lieutenant when I worked the homicide. And, he's, and then I became sheriff, and of course, my lieutenant, I retired, and he was uh, he's a very opinionated guy, and I love him. Um, but he would call me up all the time and tell me how to be sheriff, constantly. And so, it, 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 you know, at first you're like being nice about it, and you're kind of like already because you know, my lieutenant for 15 years, and I love the guy, he's a great guy. But at some point I had to like say, to, you know, say, Danny, listen, how many times were you ever sheriff? Well, that's not that's not the point. I was like, no, Danny, it kind of is the point. And so I used the tree analogy, which kind of stuck with, with a lot of my troops around me. I said, being the boss, or the actual the top of the tree, that's why I used the tree. It's like I get to see the lay of the land. Not everybody gets to see the lay of the land because underneath there, I got these different divisions. I have a chief, and he's a little bit further down the tree, branches in one. Then I got a captain, or maybe a major. Go down a little bit further, and there's there's also more branches in the way. Here, the guy sits at the top. You can see the lay of the land. You see the cliffs that may be over there that have down the tree that people don't really see. I try to play that game because he's giving me all suggestions that would be his terrible for the office and terrible for the years because he didn't set the top of the tree. So that kind of caught uh, traction with some of my troops, so they'll joke about, like, where do you guys have to go to the tree? They'll tease each other. So, um, so that's how that took off to be that being setting up the tree. Now, the sad thing is there's lots of different types of trees. You can be good in one area, setting at the top of the tree, and then they may move you to another area. And you may not be very good in that tree. And then, I'll even throw this out here and let you guys think about this a little bit. And you don't have to raise your hand if you know these people. There's people who can make it to the top of the tree, but still can't ever really interpret the lay of the land. So they're going to make it. They can make it. They got the skills to get to the top of the tree. But unfortunately, when you get to the top of the tree, they really don't know how to read the landscape. They don't get it when it comes to leadership. Which affects the entire tree for sure. So that's why you got the trees up here. All right, mission statement. Now, if I'm going to ask you a question, if you raise, and I'm going to say how many people raise your hand. If you raise your hand, I might call on you. So before you raise your hand, know that I'm going to call on you. How many people in here know the mission statement? And you repeat it to me. Raise your hand. Yes. This is not abnormal. This is not abnormal. When I came into office, we had one mission statement for all these different divisions. So what I asked my chiefs to do, and I asked them, I said, because the problem if you have one mission statement for, say, let's look, we got a correction. We got patrol movement. We got investigation. We got administrative. Can you think of one mission statement that would encompass all these different divisions that isn't so fluffy and so non-directional and so philosophical and pretty much after you look at the mission statement, you read it, you don't know what you just read, right? I mean, there's a lot of mission statements like that. And I hate to say if the sheriff's office was like that a little bit when I was reading our overall mission of what we were supposed to accomplish. So I, I passed him. I said, first of all, if we're going to leave our troops, then we have to give them the direction. And the only way we're going to give them the direction is that they understand and know what direction we're moving in order to do this to a good mission statement. 
So that's the chance to put together their own types of mission statements that's kind of specific to police and companies and the majority of their, uh, their different bureaus that they're charging. So once you can set that up and have a good mission statement, I'm sure everybody's got a mission statement, right? I mean, you got to do it. Every, I don't know of any office that does not have a mission statement. Whether you're private or you're public, you're still going to end up with some type of mission statement out there. The problem with our mission statements is either too philosophical or they're, or they're too, I guess, non-directional, but nobody ever knows them to do it all the time. We never actually try to obtain that, that goal, that mission statement. I'm not that kind of person. I want to have a mission statement and we truly try to obtain the mission that we put forward. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you, how do you know where you're going? That's, that's the hard part of actually drafting one and then getting everybody to move in that same direction. Um, all right. Now we've heard a lot of talk about leadership, but there's a very hard to say answer to. And I'm sure you guys have seen this stuff when it comes to managers versus leaders, correct? Everybody's seen the stuff that we've had. So we got just a little uh, short view, I guess, review of this. Connects daily work with great goals. Focuses only on the short-term goal. Thinks of, uh, of people as people. Sees only titles, organizational charts. Wants to earn respect, wants to be liked. Is thrilled with team member, members achieving great things. Is threatened. Powers people with honesty and transparency. Parcels out information as it, as it cost him personally. Uh, this is a rough one. We're beating up managers a little bit, but care, uh, cares mainly about results, is, is, is more concerned with processes. Um, all right, all of us have a certain amount of managerial skills and all of us have a certain amount of leadership skills. Can we all be great leaders? Um, are leaders born or are they created? Um, managers are they born or created? I guess I'll look at it this way. Uh, if, we, if we take a painting, uh, we could all in this class, in this auditorium, start painting. We could get easels in here and we could start learning how to paint. I can learn how to paint. You guys can learn how to paint. We will notice that in, even when it comes to painting that there are people that are going to be Rembrandts and there are people who be like me. Okay? I really wouldn't be able to paint very well. But could I paint? Absolutely I can paint. Could I probably paint something that you could distinguish? I bet I could. But it probably is not going to be a Rembrandt. Because there's certain talents I'll be born with and certain talents not born with. And, I'm, and in my years of being involved in leadership, I've seen that. So people are born with some special skills that are going to make them probably better leaders than others. And I've seen certain people who have manager skills that are better than other people without those manager skills. Within my four divisions, my four chiefs who I concentrate on pretty much the most. I have 1,200 people or so. Am I going to be able to get around and, and get to everybody? Of course I'm not. But I spend time, uh, probably four or five, there's a few majors also I spend some time with. Uh, because the circle of management, the circle of leadership, is only about five to seven people that you're going to be able to fully manage uh, well. And then my goal is to make sure that those people are repeating the process of what I'm trying to impart on them. Now, the funny thing about them is I have certain ones that have better manager skills and, and certain ones that have better leadership skills. My goal, sitting back at the top of that tree, is to be able to look at those guys and I guess augment or fill in where they are not capable of and keep on trying to bring them up. Uh, I have one person who's a great manager. He is an awesome manager. Uh, would not be one of my, my best picks for leadership, uh, but as far as the position he's in management, he is like, there's nobody there. And he's great at the job and I need that position. And then I have the others who have a very variety of skills that are going back and forth whenever, I guess, the situation arises. And and so with this, I had to figure out within myself, where, where did my, was I have more leadership skills, more management skills? There are lots of books and tests out there that you can take. There's Strength Finders, there's uh, The Briggs. Um, there's a whole lot of, you guys remember some of these tests, these personality tests that give you the idea of what you can take to start figuring out what your skill level is, what your strengths are, and what your weaknesses are. And then what you try to do is you, is you try to improve on those areas, or there's the philosophy behind you really don't try to improve. There's a good book I read about Rudy. You guys know about the Notre Dame football guy that spent all his life. Okay, everybody's heard about Rudy, what a great, you know, inspiring story it is. Well, the flip side of that coin I was reading once was that that was a terrible story. He, he accomplished very little other than he made it to that one goal because he focused so hard on that one area, which was literally his weakest area, 
he missed out on his strengths, which he could have accomplished so many more things if he could focus and develop his strengths. So you have a lot of different philosophies out there that you can use when it comes to leadership. And that was just one of them. Um, I'm of the philosophy that I do try to improve my weaknesses, but the only way that I do that is I have people around me that help me with my weaknesses. Okay? And I have no problem with them telling me my weaknesses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is Amanda. She's my executive administrator. And so one of the things in my staff meetings that I like to do is I don't I don't have any rank in my staff meetings. So and it kind of bugs these guys. Uh, and and yeah, you know. Um, kind of bothers them. Because when they come in, they're chiefs and they're, and, they're, and they're majors and they're captains and you know, they always bring to the school. And when we have a staff meeting, when we're going to get direction of where we need to go and set a topic, they lose rank. Nobody ever loses that rank except me. There's no rank. The best idea on the table wins. And sometimes that's hard for them to first, because my management style is very different, the leadership style, whichever you like to use, was very different than what they've been used to. And so now they've gotten through their, their hurdles, they're very passionate about their jobs. Sometimes they would start yelling and getting up and screaming at each other, and I and it'd be around noon or this time here, and I have to say, okay, uh, it was very fun, we can yourself, let's go eat, and then we come back, we're going to pick this up, and then they would go eat and come back, and then we would we get some direction on whatever the topic we're on. So I've had to look at myself. I suggest all of you, if you get the chance, take some of the tests, figure out, talk to friends. People, if you have real friends, they'll be honest with you, and you get your ego out of the way, and say, I, I want to learn because I want to be better. That's, that's what I would hope that you would do. If you, if, you can, if you get your ego out of the way, it's tough. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Oh, went the wrong way. Building relationships. Um, I had a list of stuff in here that I was going to just out of time, but I want to leave a little time for questions. But uh, I think I have one thing that you guys would really appreciate. Because I asked the other day, I said, hey, uh, what has our, our sick leave been in the last five years? Because it, it's, it's going to be part and parcel of this year for the relationship. And 2013, if you remember, I took over in 2011, you get my feet under me, so it's either 12, half of 11. In the 12, I started getting my leadership boxes and started getting around. Uh, we went from 2013 to having 4,295 hours of sick leave, basically used, to the last time we've had, which was uh, 16, was 2,000, I'm sorry, 4,295 to 2,356. We've had our sick leave almost half. Now, is that a big deal or not? That's huge. You cut your sick leave in half. How do you do things like that? Well, leadership to me, if, if, you, if you said I had to give you one, one word about leadership, it's about relationships. That's what it's all about, building those relationships. You know, there are different divisions of, and different departments of different types of uh, situations that come in different types of relationships. But we're going to take a, a broad stroke of the brush again. It's just going to be basically building relationships, getting to know your people. Do I know all 1,100 people other people and play no share accounts. So my goal is to know those people that I have that managerial span around me, that five to seven people, and get to know them and know what, what they're about, what they like to do, uh, their management style or leadership style. And more of the ways to do that, and you guys know what a ESOP is? Anybody know what an ESOP is? All right. ESOP is uh, basically it's an employee stock ownership plan. You guys ever heard of that? Yes, you've heard it back there. Okay. Some companies they basically let their employees own the company. Now we're in government, so there's no stock that you can actually purchase that's going to make you part of the government. Uh, I think Lindsay Honda has that deal going on. Their employees at Lindsay Honda actually own. So when they're working on your car or they're picking up that phone. Uh, or they're selling that car and when you have to read the customer, they own some of that company. But what do you think that does to the actual person's motivation to do a good job? It goes up. That's, well, that's the private world we're talking about. And there are several other companies that do that. Um, we're in the government. That's what we do. We're in the government business. So we can't really do it that way. So one of the ways is to get my people around me to do mine. 
I can't be the boss. I can go ahead and we can talk about authoritative leadership style. We can talk about uh, democratic. We can talk about lays off fair. You guys go over those boring terms over and over. You've heard all that stuff. Um, and you know that in different situations, you can use them differently as you'd like. For instance, uh, I can be democratic when we're setting up the table. Let's say back in the day when I was working SWAT and we were getting ready to do capital entry on the house, uh, I don't have time to do that. You're going to do this, you're going to do it now, get to that one, two corner, and be ready to go. So, in different times, you're going to use different methods. Um, but with this here, at the level that I'm at, and the level of many of you are, because I asked, I asked uh, Mr. Johns about what the level of, of different people in the room were at, um, you guys need to be able to look at your, like I do with mine, and get by it. I can come and set our collective goal, and I can come and, and I guess I could set our mission statement. I don't know if you do that either. I mean, the Chiefs set their mission statement. I let the Chiefs even hire their makers. This is the thing they do. Keep, I know this is a little important, so keep that to yourself. <laughs> but uh, I, I had one who was like, uh, give, me, give me a quick example, he did not want this major. And, uh, and he ended up having to work in a position that was similar to doing some of the major jobs. And I wanted this man in this position. But I would not, I would not just automatically promote this person in this position. I would not do that. Because the first thing to do, because I know how I would be. If, if I'm in a position of authority and you put somebody under me that's not doing a good job, and you come to me and say, what is going on? on? So I can hire you, hire you, and you promote me. Because that's exactly what these guys would do to me. And I know that. So I'm taking away their excuse. But I massaged it for a while, and then a few months later, he was like, well, I don't know, maybe it'd be all right. And he gave me a list of reasons why, I don't know, maybe you want this guy. And I was like, eh, you know, give everybody a shot. And now, they're my best friends, a great pr producer, loves him. Now, if you ask him, if you said, who made the decision to hire him? He'd go, I did. And he thinks that he did. Not me, but better the person who made it. Um, we had another situation where we were getting full-time slot, and I had to negotiate that full-time slot. And it came with us putting civilians in jail and having to deal with unions, but I have someone who thinks for sure that he's the one, because I gave it to him, to, I, I talked with him to get him to do the buy in time. And the more I let him buy into it, the more he believed that it was his idea, and the whole system was his idea, and I didn't tell him everything that wasn't behind the scenes, because his buy-in was so good that now he tells people, yeah, man, I got full-time slot. Yeah, I got that. I'm like, oh, yeah, he did it. Right. He, he helped, but he really didn't get it. But that level of motivation for him to be able to work on that program or that project was phenomenal. Why? Because that buying. And that's what we do when we also, once a year, uh, one or six months, what we try to do is we try to have a put staff meeting, and they put all the goals and objectives on that wall of what we're going to try to accomplish in that year. But it's what they want to do with me deciding. I could go in and tell them this is what we're going to do, this is how I expect it to be done, period. There's no buy-in. Uh, the, the, the odds of us being successful in that way diminish when I take that type of stance. So it's important for this uh, employee stock ownership program, at least that's what I made up. I just made this up, actually. It's something that we came up with because I think it's very similar to what the private, the private does. I like to figure out a way to do it in the public, so this is my idea of it. And so I get the buy-in. Now, employee investment. I know, I know my chiefs. I know their family. Um, I know their hobbies. I know their little silliness that they get into. I know their little habits that they do. I, I know them. And then some of the majors, I know them too. I invest in them. Uh, simple things to invest in is basically talking to them, getting to know them. If you don't know them, like I grew up there at the sheriff's office, you may not have that luxury and people coming in. The way that person is going to respond to you is if you know if they if you care about them. I mean, I'm not telling you anything here you don't know really probably, but I know when someone cares about me, that I'm going to be more responsive to them. And you in the positions that you are in, if that person that works under, under you, besides you, whatever, if they really believe you care about them, they're going to respond to you. They're going to start reducing sick leave. Because they're going to feel like, man, I don't know what it's going to do in the works today. I, nah, I'll just go to work. Because they care. And that's the most important thing I can tell you. Is building these relationships, having that buy-in, uh, going to a funeral for their family members. 
Um, you might not think that's a big deal. Let me tell you something. That is a huge deal. That is off the charts of a big deal. And I'll give you an example. I, I, was, uh, I had to go to a sheriff's function all the way up in Lorain, Ohio. And we had a, a deputy whose uncle, who used to be like a, uh, a greater deputy, worked in jail. And his uncle actually died. And it was like a dad son that I heard through the victim. I said, hey, you know, so-and-so, his uncle, his, his uncle died. And so I was up in Lorraine, Ohio, and I looked at that, and I was like, because it put it in a bolt, and I was like, Lorraine, Ohio, well, that done, and I'm all the way up here. I had this other meeting, but I'll take 15 minutes out, and I'll go give him a hug. Good Lord, you, you thought I was like, bought the lottery to him, so he was so, before I could even think of getting back into Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio, everybody the sheriff's office said, I went to the funeral of Lorraine, Ohio. I really did. Go there for that purpose, and he didn't know that. I had another function that was going on, but what did it hurt for me to go over and, and say hi to the family and let them know I do care about it because he is a good deputy, he's a good guy. But that meant a lot. There's all kinds of ways that you can get to know your people and the best way is just talk with them, get to know what they're about. You can't manage these people if they don't think you care about them. It just doesn't work. Any questions? We could talk about employee problem employees and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole other segment that we can get into. I see somebody back here smiling and giggling. So. Um, but we could, uh, we could talk about that some other time, maybe. The leadership philosophies, um, you, you really need to figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are if you're going to be good at this. Um, only you know you to some degree. If you, there's a study done at Harvard, which is a really scary study, um, a long time ago. And it said incompetent people don't know they're incompetent. They haven't let that sink in just for a moment. <coughs> they took a test. One of these tests at school, and he took a test that the people that were most critical about themselves seemed to be the most aware, and the people who, and then they, what they did is they took a test about their own level of competency and, and what they thought about themselves, and then they, they traded them off to see if the other groups actually kind of like felt the same thing. And they found that the people who were kind of incompetent or rated themselves really super high, and then the people who were not very, uh, I guess, who were competent, does that right. People who were not very confident rated themselves extremely high, and the people who were uh, very critical of themselves seemed to be the people who actually were very confident. So it's kind of funny, but if, like I said, the best way you can do is get to know people around you that you trust, that you can ask them questions, get your ego in check. We have a lot, I've put up some of these pictures. These, these guys all led from different, different points of view, different situations. Uh, would they've all been you know, great leaders had they not been in their specific fields? I don't know. Would JFK have been a great leader in, in business? I, I mean, his family was, but would, would JFK have been? I don't know. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln, would he did good in the, in the private sector? Don't know. Situations that we put ourselves into also is going to bring out certain leaders. There are certain people within your organization that, given the opportunity, you may not think that they would be all that great, but all of a sudden, in that situation, they may they be the best leader you have in that organization. And again, you've got to get to know yourself. Okay. Um, I just went through some stuff kind of fast. Um, and I want to leave, I guess, leave you with some thoughts here. The only thing I want to do is leave you with about three thoughts. Because many times when we do these type of classes, and I know it's really, um, see if you guys need some lunch or something, but um, three things I want to leave you with, because we said we're talking about leadership all day, okay? I want you to walk away out of this room with three thoughts in mind. If you're going to be a good leader, the number one thing should be in your mind is your ability to build relationships. If you want to, if you want to produce, now and, and again, back in government, what, what is it that we produce? To me, it's customer service. That's what we're supposed to be producing. Within the sheriff's office, we get a tremendous amount of, uh, and Amanda can tell you that too, uh, our division, we get so many, uh, call-ins about letters sent out about death and patrol, or some attorney who he was treated how he's treated at the jail, how wonderful they are. Uh, I don't I mean I am shocked at how many times people are complimenting death and they're just a phone conversation that they get how someone helped them out. Now the idea behind that is I I'm, I'm mentoring these these chiefs and some of these majors. They then have to take those same I I make them do that. I talk to them. Who are you mentoring? Is everybody in here in your division 
that you have people assigned to you. Are you specifically mentoring someone? If you fell over today, dead, God forbid. Is there someone you're mentoring that you're taking the time with that could step into your shoes right now? You guys mentoring them? You guys all have mentors. If you don't, the person above you should be asking you why you don't. Because when I go to my chiefs, some of my agents, who do you mentor? And they tell me who to mentor. And that's an important job because I'm mentoring them. I've um, been doing it for quite a while now. I even did it at the sheriff's office before I became chair. I was an informal leader at the time when I was a part rank. Um, and so those people have come up ranks with me though. And I expect them to have, to have whoever they're mentoring, I want my chiefs to go to say that captain and say, who are you mentoring? And if you can't tell me someone you're mentoring, I want to know why not. Because when you're in a leadership position, that is your job to be a mentor, a facilitator, a trainer, sometimes a friend, sometimes a boss, to those individuals. We have big staff meetings, we have little staff meetings. When we have little staff meetings, it's again, it's about relationship building, you train. And maybe someone doesn't make it to a funeral, we try to make sure that you know why don't make it to a funeral, or that relationship building. We stand in for each other and make sure that the truth is that they're care about. Uh, so if you're not practicing the skills of relationship building, you are not in the, you are not actually obtaining the credit of your I'll tell you I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you're just being a manager and that's all you want to do. Okay. But then you shouldn't be in a leadership position if you're not practicing both skills of manager and leadership. The next is make sure that you have a mission statement that's clear and concise. Make sure you know the mission statement. I mean, I was threatening you guys to raise your hand and make someone repeat it or say it. You know, let's pray for your hand up. I actually had an account one time repeating it verbatim and called me on it. Because I did this to to a group and I said, I don't even know what you're saying. So he's like, I don't. And I was like, well, okay, repeat it. Not done, you sure did. Um, but nobody else in the room could. Um, know your mission statement and work on your mission statement. Repeat your mission statement. Have goals set that you are attaining together on a group setting that you start out every quarter, you're looking at your goals. Do your goals mirror your mission statement? How close are you to getting your goals? Have those goals that you can measure. I don't care if it's uh, the government, if it's customer service. And then do surveys. And we have surveys that we do. Uh, we have cards that we can put out to people in different areas of control. Uh, we just get a lot of confidence. But for your own division, whatever you're doing, how you want to look at your mission statement and then make sure that it's something that you can measure and then make sure it's something you're following up on. You may have to, you may have to like, modify it, make your results are what they should be. Why is it the results where they should be? step back and look away from it and see why you're not reaching those goals. So again, it's about mission statement. Set the goals, and again, you've got to follow up. Constantly be following up as your, as your leader. Following up with people, following up with mission statement, following up with your directions. Sometimes you have to change those directions if you're not attaining those goals. Now, I, like I said, I can throw a whole bunch of stuff at you and go over and over, but I want you to remember those two things. Relationship building, have your goals set, follow up on your goals, make sure you're meeting your goals. If you can do those things in an area of what your mission statement is and the relationship to your people, you will see a change in the actual organization that you work for that will be in a positive direction. Questions? Any questions? I'm going to do a lot of stuff at you real quick there, sorry. All right. question. Can you tell us more about Citizens Academy? Yes. Uh, Citizens Academy is an opportunity, it's what, 12 weeks now, right? One night a week that you get to come in and you get to uh, basically get to play the comics. Okay, you get to go and uh, you get to do our scenario. We have a big screen up here, it's like shoot, don't shoot. And it gives you the opportunity to uh, feel what it's like. It's a very interactive program. So you get to come up and you get to the cop. And the screen is controlled by, it's got all kinds of variable scenarios that can play out. And so what happens is you walk up and you talk to the person. When you talk to them, they react with you and whatever you're asking them to do. We've had people, not kidding, we've had people like um, basically come up and say, can I see your driver's license and registration? And they'll move like this and they get shot. And we're like, you shot the guy who's getting his driver's license. And they're like, ah, yeah. 
And then we have a monitor we can put on people and you can watch them. This is a video. This is not real. And all they're doing is they're walking up to a screen that's this big and they're, and they're interacting the screen and their heart's starting to go. And you can see this. Now what is interesting, I'll share with you, I, got this, I have not got this to our citizen academy uh, and our training academy. Because uh, you'll see something like this on the face, I'm sorry, citizen academy. And then I'll tell you what we just saw. Citizen can also you get to go ride around with squad, you get the cruiser, um, you get to see the type of weapons that are used, you get the, uh, there's different groups that are coming from the FBI, fire, this is just, just a variety of people that you get to go out and have fun with, or what you do, whether you're, whatever law enforcement uh, municipality you're in or township. You get to see what your local, local law enforcement is, it's a fun time to learn a lot of stuff. Recently, when I'm trying to get into our citizens academy right now, everybody loves the taser, right? I think we actually have somebody that tased in the class, don't we? People can volunteer to get tased. Anybody here want to be a volunteer to get tased? No? Okay. You also get to go in on a home burglary where it's a burglary in progress, and you and your, your partner get to go in on a house with send mission guns, but, but she uh, will, will kind of throw the bullet at you. So you get to go in on a home burglary and see how you react, and it's all video, so you get to come back and watch yourself, what you did. It's very interesting to watch people, and this is a whole other topic to see, how you think you did something when the stress hits you, and you go, well, I did this and this. And then you feel that stress, and, and all of a sudden you go back and watch the video, and you go, I did that? Because you don't, because of how the stress is. But recently we have a video that I'm trying to get over there that showed uh, a police officer being tased. Okay? No big deal. Except that they gave this police officer a specific task. And the specific task for this police officer was to take him a simulation gun, put the simulation gun in his hand. And they said, when we tase you, which you took the probes like this, right here, we want you to try to shoot the gun while you're being tased. And a gun, he pulled 10 rounds as he saw while he's being tased. That's, pretty, that's a pretty big deal. So then they decided, well, let's do this. Uh, we're going to put the taser underneath your, your waistband and your shirt, okay? We're going to taste you from back. These guys are taking the palms. I mean, they get shot. I'm like, oh, there's good now. But, uh, they took their actual, they took a ride and got hit in the back. And so they got hit, and this guy was able to pull his shirt, as he's, as he's, as he's shaking, pull his shirt, pull his hand, and he got a couple rounds off his back. Pretty scary stuff. Uh, the next class that I've suggested to this county, which is a fun time, uh, would be the volunteers in public safety service. Uh, like I said, that one is a, that's a very uh, hands-on, learn how to, we've had, we've had to give you a couple of stories where people went to the class. We had a guy that was at his house, he smelled gas. Uh, he didn't know where the gas was coming from, he smelled the gas. Because he went through the VIPS program, he went out to the curb, and he knew where to turn the gas off, because you get a device that helps you turn the gas off. You get a kit and all kinds of stuff that you need to get. You need to go through the class, you need a backpack and all kinds of stuff. He went out the curb, was able to turn the gas off the curb, called the fire department, they came in, and the neighbors had a leak. They were coming up out on the ground. Could have, you remember all, about two years ago, a year ago, Upper Arlington house blew up? Could have had one of those, but because this guy went through the train, he was able to make sure his neighbors were safe. That's kind of some of the stuff you would learn going through this program. You know, he talks about, if we have an incident, like, you know, going on down there with uh, Hurricane Matthews, okay? Tell you how much food you should save up, save up the house, how much water, you need gasoline because you know many people have no power. Um, a lot of people told me get broken into uh, just a train wreck there. Now we could have something like that here. We could have a tornado. You know, we've had a big tornado and things like that. I know we had one a couple years back. We had ice storms that shut us down for a week. We had part of a hurricane come through, shut us down for a week. After that hurricane, I got a generator for it. And I said, you know, I'm gonna spend I think it's like eight grand. This generator runs the whole house. And I said, now that I've done this, I will never need that generator. You know, I never need that generator on the horse. I just knew that would happen. That's just how it works. But at least I have it. If something goes wrong, at least I'm going to be able to turn my house and make sure that you know, the kids, whatever, will be taken care of. So those are some of the programs. Yes, ma'am. Who can sign up for this and how they do it? Just get on our website. Uh, we have a PR throughout the year. We have a, um, we have a the RAD class. I don't know if that's coming up anytime soon. We can teach it here if you wanted it. Um, in this building, so if you do it right after work, it's a self-defense class just for women. It's an awesome class. It really is. It's uh, uh, we just it's, I don't know the dates. It's just on our website, but it's a it's a class that uh, teaches you. It's a class that actually you're going to get attacked. 
There's two. You know, see, you're making a face about it, but here's what happens. Here's the When I say that, everybody's like, oh, no. But here's the problem if you take a self defense class and you've never been attacked. Guess what happens when you do get attacked? You freeze up. So what happens is, do, do this class, you get attacked about three different times with a, with a one of the deputies is going to have a full suit on, and you are to key off on that deputy as hard and as fast as you can. You to wear him out. Uh, and we've had some of them, whoa, I'm glad I wasn't in that suit because man, mm -hmm. man they're bad. So, so we've, got, we've had a couple that have gone through that. Can, um, raise your hand if you went through that training. Oh, well, did you like it? And, love it. and what it does is now that someone lays hand on you, you know what to do. We've had some women when they, where they, when they first did it, the first time they got hands laid on, you know what they did? They clapped, almost faint. And you get coached through it, coached through it. So what we're counting on, that if God forbid it happens to you, what initially will just happen is your training will kick in. And we see women go from being meek to like, oh, I don't know. By the end of the class, they will break somebody's nose. It's just fun to watch the transformation of these women. Like, I'm going to knock someone out if they touch me. The confidence builds them up. So it's uh, that's just one other program that we have at the Sheriff's Office. So we have, we have quite a few good programs, and, and they're paid for them. Home, home, Homeland Security grant money pays for them. Uh, so please take advantage of those. Yes, ma'am. How long is this Academy? It's once a week for how many weeks? I think it's 12 weeks. 12. Okay. Yeah, and then the uh, VIPS is, uh, is it like three Saturdays? What is it, Dave? It's 20 to 10. Uh, VIPS just started running Tuesday and Thursday, 6 to 10. How many, how many more? A week, four weeks now. Four weeks, okay. They shortened the, the week time. Okay, it's uh, but it's I would suggest in the times that we live today, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean, I've been, I'm an old guy, but I have never seen such, uh, I don't know, darn times, worldwide, countrywide, you know, countywide. We're living in some scary times, um, and so not to have skills to be able to take care of yourself or your family, you know, that's your leadership. Point right out there. If you're going to step up to be a leader, then make sure you step up. First of all, look out for your family. Okay? Once you take care of them, make sure they're okay because you've got the skills and you've learned it. Then, okay, now step out and take care of your community. Step out with your with your first responders because you're going to learn chain of uh, command, you're going to learn incident command, you're going to learn all that kind of stuff. You're going to learn about fire incidences, you're going to learn about law enforcement. Um, step up for your communities after you take care of your family. Again, that's being a leader. And we have, and it's all free. You can come take advantage of it. So why don't we take advantage of it? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Early in your presentation, you mentioned that um, there's a citizen in the people. Um, they've also said that the uh, condition had a citizen advisory committee. Yes. But to my understanding, that doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Well, there are in certain parts of the country. There's, I guess there are certain citizens review boards. Uh, I have a citizen advisory board. Uh, review boards uh, in some states have subpoena power. Uh, they basically function as grand jury. They basically, that's what they do. Uh, so I don't have one. Uh, first of all, I don't have any legislative power to give them power to be able to do that. Uh, that would take the municipality to do it more than a county statute or a state statute for the county to be able to do that. That's what I was wondering if there's not, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I've never been in favor of it, only because it's uh, it's uh, it's a little confusing when you got a grand jury and you have know, citizen review. Each one has a grand jury has a statutory authority to do what they have to. And how they select? How would you select a a citizen advisory board? How would you do that? There's a lot of processes involved in it. And again, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to get back to the tree incident. I said the tree. We got people in the branches now that don't see all the problems with it. And I said the top three go, eh, you know what that's gonna cause, you know what this one cause. And I see a lot of problems when you get into that area because you don't know how to pick them, you don't know how to select them. Grand jury, how's grand jury selected? Anybody know? Huh? You're voting. You're voting. That's how you get selected. If you vote, you're subject to maybe get a uh, letter of mail that says you're now on the citizens review board, which we call grand jury, and you're now totally report. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of have that on the place. But I got the advisory board with it. I want to know what my community is thinking. I want to know if there's rumors, if there's problems, uh, if there's things that I can address uh, together with my community. Because I spent 
I'm going to be sheriff next year, as far as most of you guys know. But when I was a sheriff, or still am a sheriff, while I was being sheriff, I would go out to a lot of community events. I wanted to hear what community was saying. There were a lot of churches that uh, I could tell you all the pastors in town, uh, community events, which is something I always like to go to because I want to hear what they have to say. That's something I always do. So that's that. Sometimes it's always curious about how do you determine what the language of the jurisdiction the current time sheriff's department is going to have versus what the CBD or the Texas Police Department is going to do geographically? How do you control how to work with that? It, it's, now, we're in Shepherd, it's kind of funny because some people don't understand, like, we have Japanese pull people over downtown or something like that. We can't do this city of Columbus. Well, city of Columbus has a great job. Okay, so we have jurisdiction everywhere. Uh, but what we do is people, like, the different municipalities, they cover their district, Columbus has covered their district. Uh, you know, we can actually rest anywhere, we can cite somebody in, anywhere to the sheriff's office. Uh, we have a lot of task forces involved with the different communities. We don't staff on people. Uh, the sheriff's office does not do that. There's other other parts of the, of the country that they get in line. It's how the sheriff's office is in. And that doesn't do anything to hurt our communities. That's all that does. For sure. So uh, basically, they, every, every municipality runs their own. There's plenty of workplace to go around for all of us. So that's kind of that's a good question. Do you try to coordinate? We do. We actually, we, you know, our, our SWAT team works together a lot. Uh, and we'll have different task force, like the Internet Crime Kids Children's Task Force. That's got 12 different agencies on it. And they work out the sheriff's office. Uh, but you have everybody from CPD, the uh, uh, Obama, the Central Village City, uh, just a lot of different agencies that we work together. Uh, we just got a new dog, too. We'll have to let out there. So we got a new dog. His name is Ruger. He's a black lab, and he's a special dog. Because Ruger has the ability to smell uh, electronic storage devices. So what we've been finding is that as these uh, child exploitation suspects, you know, predators, whatever you want to call them, they've been, they, they're getting a little smarter. So what they're doing is they're getting these flash drives and they're getting SD cards and they're getting all this other stuff and they're hiding this stuff. So if, if the officers go to the house and they get a computer, they're not on the computer. So what they're doing is they're hiding in everything from cigarette lighters to everything you can think of because they don't want them to be able to find what they're downloading or the images they got or the videos they got. And so Ruger comes in and you know, there's only 24, less than 24 in the country of these types of dogs. And so detectives can go in and search location and they get certain devices, but then um, uh, Ruger goes in and he gets to the other devices. He can go around the room and you know, sit down and show or something like that and pull it up in front of you like, wow, give me that time. So um, we're kind of proud to have a whole group in there. So that's, that's another one. That's a uh, Homeland Security. You've got the bulk cash funding task force. Uh, that's BPA, uh, Treasury Department, FBI. <coughs> so we're, we're involved in a lot of folks on that. And we've got the stocking unit. We just got, we, we share all the resources and we're also working together on a lot of programs. But when you're talking basic patrol, which is one of the district that's assigned, you know, those in there, not in there, so it's no city or old X or whatever. Yes, sir. Uh, I've had a lot of, uh, I have a lot of real estate, I used to be in real estate, a long time ago. 
Uh, they're trying to talk me into going to that. We're talking about doing consulting. Uh, and some of my friends that are still in law enforcement um, also talking about some leadership on a bigger, on a larger scale of workshops. Also, efficiency studies, uh, management studies, being able to uh, go to the private and public and improve those operations. So, just kind of, just, yes. Any more acting? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't anticipate doing any more acting right now. Um, you know, I got a group of parents meeting who text me the other night. He's like, dude, I just saw you in a movie. So, um, uh, for some reason, they're showing the uninvited guests a whole bunch. Right? Like, like, come up for some reason, I don't know why. Uh, you know how I got involved in that? I worked undercover. I used to have real, real long hair, extra rings, and they would give you an assignment. And you would go out that night, and, and this is different. Undercover back in the 80s is totally different than undercover today. It's, it's night and day. Uh, back then, if, if you would do what we were doing in the 80s today, you're a cowboy, you'd be written up. You would get, you would get disciplined. But back then, we didn't have backup, and we didn't have no phones. I mean, you know, in the late 80s, you know, it, it was rare to see a painter. Uh, and it was only just a doctor, you know, they were just big. You know, and I'm not buying dope. Huh? Why am I need to pay these? That's the first thing I walk in and take it from, you know? So, those days were real different. You'd meet at roll call and turn around and say, okay, what you got going tonight? You got a deal going on, you got a deal. You need backup, no, it's the guy bought from the four, we're good, you'd leave. And then Sarge's job was to turn around and go and actually, we, we called radio room, he called radio room, and we got in trouble, we had to call radio room, and he'd say, anybody call in tonight, you need to You know, something like one night I got in the car, I said, we're going to buy pounds a week. I can remember, it was like, dude, I'm in, we're going to buy this, buy this week. We just come and keep driving. Driving around my county. I started in front of the county, I said, We're driving to get to Ross County. I'm like, Where are we going? They're like, Where are you going? What the hell am I going to do about it? There's no way to take me. I had a phone. It's really hard, too. I'm married at this moment. She gets like this. I'm like, I'm married. So it puts a lot of strain on relationships, too. But I ended up getting moved. The shirt and tie bureau, the politics, I got in, I got our, our unit got disbanded. And so I liked being this character. You need to fake IDs and you, know, you have to work your way into a group and, and you be this person. So I thought it was fun being this character. So I found this creative outlet that I really liked, but I was not able to burglaries and, and lawnmower thefts. I mean, I was like dying. So it's like, but, you know, it's important to do work. Um, and I had to wear a suit and tie, cut my hair, no earrings, and stuff like that. And so uh, I went to audition a couple of times for a couple of few years and I saw and they were like, dude, yeah, we saw it. So I wish I had a cat go with a cat And then all of a sudden I went to audition a couple of times and I got cast as the lead role and a few other things and then I got an agent and then did a few different movies and started doing commercials like cut fried chicken and hot <laughs> dogs and all this stuff. <laughs> so it was, uh, but it was fun. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. But no, I don't, I don't see that in the future. Yes, ma'am. Once you are no longer the Franklin County Sheriff, will you still be deputized? I could. That's I've had sheriffs around the county, uh, different counties, to say, "Hey, you want to carry a commission to let me just call us and tell us we'll put you on our roster." So I might. I don't know. Uh, I might keep it for a while. Um, I don't know. I might talk to this to the new sheriff in here and see if he'll let me keep it here. Uh, him and I meet once a month uh, to have coffee. Uh, really nice guy. Uh, I like him. Uh, I, you know, I told him I'd help him any way I could. Politics aside and all that kind of stuff, it's more about making sure the office functions properly and, and moves forward, and, and that the communities are taken care of and the deputies are taken care of, and I, and I think you'll be there. All right. All right. I appreciate it. Very much. My pleasure. Right? My pleasure. <laughs>